Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I'm glad I can talk at this seminar. Okay, so uh, let's get to the topic. Uh, I will talk about geometric ellipticity. So first of all, I need to say what I mean. What is the setup in, in the in most general terms? It's this one. So I have a functional phi, uh, which is defined on geometric objects, whatever they are. This might be currents, varifolds, manifolds, whatever you want, wish, with real values. And uh, we want to study critical points of this functional. So typical examples of such a problem, something that I call geometric variational problem, is the plateau problem when you want to minimize the area of the, 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 the Functional is just the area of your object uh, among surfaces, say, that same boundary. The other one is the isoparametric problem when you want to minimize not the area, but the, well, the area, yes, the area of the boundary of some open set. And this the set of geometric objects will be just a, I would call them competitors for the, for the problem. The, competitor, the class of competitors in this second one would be just all all uh, the boundaries of open set uh, volume one. Okay, so, but this is maybe too general. We want to focus on more specific problems. So let me introduce the notation setup for the whole talk. Uh, so we are dealing, so forget about M for, for a while. We are dealing with an open set in RM and we are given an integrand f, which is defined on the Grassmannian of k-dimensional planes in Rn, and the values are real, real values, but we always assume it's bounded away from zero and from infinity. So we don't want infinity. And uh, the geometric objects that we're dealing with are going to be varifolds, so the space of varifolds is noted e that both has v k u, k-dimensional varifolds inside the open to Q, and they are by definition just random measures of the Cartesian product of U times the Christmas. Now, uh, the functional that we want to minimize, uh, study critical points, uh, is defined on these varifolds, and it just it acts on a varifold V just by integration with K. So in uh, in general, one could also ask, uh, assume that f depends on u here, so would be would depend also on the point. But for simplicity and for the purposes of this talk, because I'm talking about ellipticity, uh, we we don't assume that there is an x. Right? One might uh, also assume that x and t, but uh, for the purposes of this talk, we don't need it. So I would just all my integrands will be defined just on the graph. Uh, and the typical example of a random of a varifold is this one. So now assume M is something smooth like a manifold, or maybe just an HKK rectifiable set. Uh, so with this set, we can associate a varifold in this way. So uh, well, it's written. Well, it, it's just a the Hausdorff k-dimensional Hausdorff measure on M, but on the Grassmann in the Grassmannian it just chooses always the tangent plane. At each point x, you choose the tangent plane, the Dirac mass associated with the tangent. Okay, and now we introduce some more notation. Uh, we the, we de, in, we define the weight measure. So double bar v double bar is just the weight measure is the projection of measure v onto the first coordinate. So, so defined by this formula. And we also define V subscript F with the F V weighted with this F so as another weight. Uh, okay, and now we define the first variation. Okay, so first variation denoted delta S V is a linear functional acting on vector fields G. So G is a vector field which is supposed to be smooth and compactly supported in the open set field. 
And for a, once we are given a vector field, we produce a flow of this vector field, it's called HT. We push forward the variables. I'm not, I didn't define what it means to be to push forward, but I'm writing this formula just so that you know it may have some has some meaning. Uh, so and and we compute the energy of this push forward, and then we differentiate with respect to uh, t at zero. And uh, all of these have some formulas. You can differentiate under the integral and compute compute, and then you end up with this this formula. So the first variation on a vector field g is given exactly by this formula. And what is this formula? So this is something that I want to, to remember from this slide, this, this one formula. So uh, the first variation is on the vector field g is acts of the following way. You differentiate the, the, the vector field. You, this is a, a linear map. The differential g at x is a linear map from rn to rn. And, uh, and uh, you then compose with this map pft and take the trace. And what is pft? pft is a linear map. It's the same type, type as, as the as GFX. So pft is a linear map. We know it's a projection. So composing with, with itself, this itself. And the image of pft is p. So it's just some projection. So if this is p, pft projects onto t, but it's not an orthogonal projection. Right? It projects onto t, but not orthogonally. And uh, we additionally know that it's an orthogonal, self-adjoint, and the projection is self-adjoint if and only if it's orthogonal. So this here says that this pf t is an orthogonal projection if and only if this derivative of f is uh, so, for example, if f is constant, which means it's an area integrand, because if, you, if f is constant here, then you just integrate, take the mass of the variable. So, if f is constant, then this is always an orthogonal projection. And in this case, this is just it's a projection onto t. So, this item here is just a, a project, a divergence inside t, the usual divergence. But in case f is not that's not constant, so DFT is not zero, then you have some other projection onto T, but some from some other angle. And uh, so I call this an F divergence of, of the vector field. Okay, so the first variation is given by integration of the F divergence of, of your vector. Uh, okay, so now we say what it means to be stationary. We, I said we want to study critical points, so Critical points are exactly stationary, are F stationary variables, which means that the first variation is zero. Okay. Uh, now, uh, aha, I, uh, now I want to tell you about momentum system. So, if you want to study critical points, then uh, the main uh, the main strategy to approach the regularity of critical points is to First, to prove that it kind of you have some kind of alpha similarity. So uh, you do that usually by proving monotonicity formula. And now I want to say that uh, monotonicity formula works roughly only for the area integrand. This is something I understood uh, like a few months ago, and I'm so happy to have to tell you. So, uh, <clears throat> so how do you prove monotonicity? First, assume your just for simplicity, assume your variable is left stationary, uh, and take some ball. Assume the ball centered at zero and the radius r plus epsilon inside your ball. And now you plug in this vector field to the first variation. So this vector field is just at x is just x times some cutoff function. The cutoff function has this graph. So up to r is one, and then goes down to zero. And then when you plug in this function, you compute the First variation on, on this vector field passed to the limit with epsilon, and you get this nice formula here. So what is this? On the left hand side, you have a uh, density ratio, so the monotonicity, monotonicity of density ratio. So if you want this guy to be monotone, you want the left hand side to be non-negative. So that you, on the left, you get, you get the derivative of density ratios, and on the right, you have the derivative of something like that. 
And uh, so at sufficient condition, so we want spontaneity, right? So the sufficient condition for the left-hand side to be non-negative would be that the integrand here is non-negative. So assume it's non-negative for all t x, right? If if we could assume that, then we would have momentum. But unfortunately, actually this is a simple exercise in linear algebra, that if you have a, a projection uh, such that this is non-negative for all x and for all x, right? Uh, then actually it must be set at times. This is a very simple linear algebra uh, <coughs> exercise in linear algebra. So uh, so you cannot hope that this guy is non-negative almost like or everywhere, because this would mean that you have you are f is constant. Uh, because this is self jointness, as I told in the last slide, means that uh, this guy is an orthogonal projection, and uh, it's an orthogonal projection only if the uh, derivative of f is zero. So a uh, more general result can be found in the ALAB paper on, on uh, this one from 74. He's actually it's more general in the sense that he's also uh, he's also dealing with some other balls like not not Euclidean but um, he, you would expect maybe oh uh, maybe uh, it's a, this thing is about Euclidean balls maybe you should just change the norm change the balls to something else and we will get more messy but it's not true uh, his alert shows that you cannot actually what he proves is that if you have more tonicity then I mean, if, or maybe what he proves is that if this guy on the right-hand side uh, is always non-negative, then you are basically area. So F must be area. Okay, so you don't have one thing uh, for any other integrand than the area integrand. Uh, or, well, maybe you have, but certainly you will not prove it this way. Uh, Okay, so now get, let's get back to electricity. Uh, so, okay. To, to define electricity, to, to understand what it means and what we do, what we need it for, uh, first I want to talk about certain results on minimizers. So, okay, so what do we get without monotonicity? First, uh, let's set, uh, let's uh, define the problem. The problem that we are deal want to deal with is to take the family of competitors. So in this in this case, it will be a family of closed subsets of U. Uh, actually, I should also assume they are equitable uh, with finite me HK measure, and this family should be closed, should be stable under taking some deformation. So phi is a deformation. So assume M is in A. And phi is a deformation which is p1 and which has which does not move points close to the boundary of u. So this basically just acts inside u but doesn't move points near near the boundary of u. So assume you have a class of competitors A, which is closed under this operation of taking deformations. And then uh, there exists a minimizer. Actually, well, I will explain what is a, what I mean by a minimizer in situation. Uh, so there exists a varifold. There exists a varifold which has smaller energy than any element of the of your family. And there also exists a minimizing sequence such that if I take the associated varifolds, they converge to my varifold V. And you can even uh, prove that the support of the limit varifold is HKK rectifiable in terms of, in the sense of Federer. So it means it has HK finite measure and can, can be covered by images of Lipschitz maps up to set of measure zero, counting the many. Uh, and you can even show that you have your, the weight measure of V is absolutely continuous both ways with uh, the k-dimensional Hausdorff measure restricted to support, and you have alpha singularity. As long as you're far away from the boundary of u, you have that. Uh, so all of these you can prove without assuming anything on f. Just f is a okay. It should be continuous map from the Grassmannian to reals, and should be bounded away from zero and from infinity. And you get all these conditions without any other assumption. 
And then ellipticity comes in. What do you need? Because at this point, at this point, we don't know whether this set uh, sigma is actually a minimizer in the sense that what is the energy? We don't know what is the energy of sigma. Uh, is it the same as the energy of V, of V, at? We don't know because we only have information about the weight measure and we don't know what Fairfold has, has something in the Grassmannian and we don't know anything about the part that in the Grassmannian. So uh, we say that F is elliptic. Now ellipticity is something that ensures that this holds. So it actually ensures that this sigma is, a, is some kind of a minimizer. Uh, actually, in, this, in the way I, I'm putting it here, it doesn't say that sigma is in the class A, uh, but, uh, but at least it's a, an HKK rectifiable set and has the, has the energy, which is the minimum of energy of A. And uh, the ellipticity is actually ensures this. This is, this is what the, this is a compatibility condition between the Grassmannian part and the space part of the dark field. So it means that V chooses the right, the tangent plane almost everywhere. Okay, so this, this is a kind of a met, meta theorem. Uh, I was, when I wrote this, I, I meant basically my, my results with Yan Xin Fang, uh, but uh, there are a lot of, in different flavors, this kind of result is present already in the works of Reifenberg, of Almgren from 68, from the 60s now, more recently in the series of paper of Fidel de Filippis, Sonia de Rosa, Francesco Giraldi, Camilla de Lelis, and Francesco Maggi. There is, a, there is also a series of papers by Her Jenny Harrison, Harrison Pugh. Okay, Guy David maybe didn't have an existence result, but also was involved uh, defining some conditions. So uh, a lot of people were working on this. <clears throat> but uh, the main point here is that ellipticity is exactly this condition, and which ensures compatibility of Grassmannian part and space part of our of our uh, result. Okay. So uh, I didn't say what is ellipticity till now. I just said what it what is the consequence of ellipticity. But uh, let us define ellipticity. So, uh, so what, first we need to define a test pair. So we take a pair of sets S and D. We call it a test pair if D is a flat disk, k-dimensional disk, and S is an HKK rectifiable set which is compact and contains the boundary of the disk. And uh, and the boundary of the disk is not a Lipschitz retract of S. And also, okay, we assume it's not. S is not equal to D. So uh, this is Angen's definition. He used this definition uh, for his, in, his, in his 68 paper. Uh, and with this definition, he also defines what it means to be elliptic. So we say F is Angen elliptic, and we write F is in AE. If, the, if for any test per SD, the energy of S is bigger than the energy of D. Well, this is a uh, and under this condition, you can prove. Uh, and uh, there is also a variant of angular elliptic, mainly uniformly um, uniform angular elliptic, is that you have a quant uh, quantitative control over this difference. So it's comparable the constant with the difference of measure. Uh, okay. So, uh, so what are the properties? For example, the of uniform angular elliptic. So uh, it, the, the area integrant is clearly inside the class, and the city neighborhood of the area in, is in the class. Uh, so if you have an, a member of the class, then you can push it by a diffeomorphism, and uh, you're still in the class. So it's stable and then pushed forward by, by diffeomorphism. Uh, so the set of all uniformly angular elliptic integrants is convex in the space of all functions of the Grassmannian. The real good, and in case of codimension one, you actually have a full characterization of uniformly angularly integrant, namely uh, f must come from a convex norm. I will explain what the, what it means in the next slide. Next. 
some in some uh, later. Uh, so there are still questions. So because we don't, this definition is, is you have to test this condition for a test pair for all test pairs, and these test pairs are defined using if she's retract and so on. So it's a bit hard to check. So actually, there are no really examples, non-trivial. Right. So the question is, are there any non-trivial elliptic integrals? Right. By non-trivial, I mean they don't fall into this category. So not not in the neighborhood of the area and not push forward of the area, say. So we don't know. So for example, take an take a non-Euclidean norm on, on Rn. This gen generates a, a house, some kind of Hausdorff measure, an anisotropic Hausdorff measure. This Hausdorff measure actually can be expressed as this energy for, for a particular integrand, namely this one. Take the measure of the unit ball in k-dimension and you divide it by the unit, the measure of the intersection of t with the unit, the new ball, respect to this norm new. And the question is, okay, is this analytic? That, that I think we don't know yet. Uh, is some kind of convexity sufficient for elasticity? That's another question. So, I mean, it's not, we, I think there is no, uh, we cannot prove yet that uh, some kind of convexity of F implies Amgran elasticity. And uh, so in another question related, I mean, like if you if you give me an integral with a formula, like just uh, just write a formula you can, and then check whether it's uh, elliptic. We don't know how to do that. Uh, but as I said, ellipticity has something to do with convexity. So let me define what it means to be convex for an integrand. So in case of co-dimension one integrand, it's rather easy because the Grassmannian is just the projective space and actually you can, uh, instead of projective space, we can, can work with sphere, so a unit sphere. Uh, so if you identify the Grassmannian with a projective space, then being what is what it means to be convex is, is rather uh, straightforward. So it's written here. Uh, so you associate with F this map new, you extend it so that it's positively homogeneous, right? And, uh, and we say that F is convex if this N is a norm, which means it's a convex positively homogeneous function. So this means, this is what it, I mean, convexity means in co-dimension one. But in higher co-dimensions, it's much more difficult. So uh, we say that F is extendedly convex. It can be extended to convex function on the whole space of k vectors in Rn. So if you don't know, well, you should just know that the Grassmannian can be, I mean, the oriented Grassmannian can be realized as the set of simple vectors, k vectors in Rn. And if you can extend this, a function from simple k vectors to all k vectors, then we say that it's tendedly to a convex function and tendedly convex. Okay, so, uh, but there is a weaker notion of convexity, weakly convex. Uh, so F is weakly convex if for each choice of a k plus one dimensional space in Rn, the restriction of F to the Grassmannian of k planes in R is convex in this, in this first meaning, right? So, uh, and this has to hold for all choices of k plus one dimensional space systems. Okay, so we have extendedly convex and weakly convex. Uh, okay, so now I want to, to understand that the definition of under elasticity strongly relies on the choice of test pairs, on the family of test pairs. If we change the family of test pairs that we're working with, the problem of ellipticity, of checking ellipticity, say, is dramatically different for different choices of test pairs. So, for example, if we choose a, a normed abelian group and we can define a, what, a, what I say here is a test G pair, will be a pair of k-dimensional Lipschitz G chains that, uh, now this one is an algebraic operation of taking a boundary for Lipschitz chains, let's do that. Uh, 
uh, and D is contained in a kinetic strain. So D is flat, D is supposed to be flat, S is on surface above D, like around D, so it has the same boundary, and uh, we call this a G pair. It's a different notion because in the previous notion, we were talking about Lipschitz retroactions on the boundaries, and now we have this boundary here, this boundary operator, is purely algebraic operator defined on this k-dimensional G chain. And for this, for this set of family of test pairs, it's uh, actually there is a paper of Burago Ivanov from 2004, which says that integrand is angular R elliptic if and only if it is extendedly convex. So uh, at least if you take the coefficient group G to be the real, then uh, angen R ellipticity uh, uh, is exactly the same as extensively convex, extensively convex convexity. Okay. So this is settled, say, for in this case. But what I'm saying is that uh, the choice of test pairs actually makes a difference. If we are working with this uh, rectifiable sets which cannot be retracted onto the boundary, then you don't have this theorem, and it's a, bit, a completely different problem. You don't have algebraic tools to deal deal with it. You have to do something else. Okay, so let us go back to electricity uh, and, and recall that the desired property that we wanted to have is this, so that. Uh, so that V chooses the tangent plane almost everywhere, the right plane. And uh, so after we wrote the paper with Yan Chin Fang, uh, I met Antonio and I met Urlish uh, online in 2016, I guess. And we were discussing what exactly the condition should be that would ensure that this holds. And we cooked up this condition, which we called BC, because it was in the box on the blackboard. So the box condition say, and uh, it reads the following way. So for any varifold of, with this structure, so varifold, which is just the restriction of the k-dimensional Hausdorff measure to some k-plane t, and on the Grassmannian you have some probability measure mu. So for any varifold of this of this type, if it is stationary, then mu must select the right the right plane. Okay, uh, this and we cooked up, we tailored this condition so that the, 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 the proof that we had with, in the paper with Frank would work. This was exactly that. Uh, I think that was actually Orly's idea to, 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 to have this. And this. Uh, okay, and roughly at the same time, there was the paper by Guido de Filippis, Antonio de Rosa, and Francesca Guidalti. Uh, where they prove uh, that certain condition, which is called atomic condition, is sufficient and necessary for the rectifiability of stationary variables. Actually, for variable future, uh, total variation is the random measure, but okay, that's the technical difference. Uh, so they, a, bit, a bit earlier, they, they introduced this atomic condition and it reads the following. Uh, so for any probability measure on the Grassmannian, you define this, this thing AF, which is a linear map, and it's just defined by integrating this PF, this projection that I was referring to, but the star, the, the adjoint. And, uh, and for, so you, you define this guy, and for any mu, uh, this guy should have this proper, these two properties. So the, the dimension of the kernel should be at most n minus k, and if it's exactly n minus k, then mu is a Dirac on, on, on something. I mean, like, it is, well, it is just an atomic measure. I think this is why it's called atomic condition. So this condition should imply that mu is an atomic measure. And if you tell out all the definitions that are hidden here and here, uh, and you will very quickly see that they are the same. So uh, in our paper with Antonio, um, we proved that they are the same. This is actually a very simple observation. Uh, I mean, maybe not trivial, but uh, not so complicated. But the hard part is here. 
We proved also that uh, AC implies alveolar. Actually, we proved that BC applies, not BC. Okay, and I will talk a bit about the proof now, uh, not not in detail. Uh, so how do we how do we do it? So assume you have an integrand which is we do it by contradiction. Assume you don't have an integrand which is in AC but not in AE, right? And so this means that you have a it's not in AE, so it means that you have a test pair uh, with so that S has smaller energy than D. Actually, uh, if you this is just for simplicity of the presentation. Uh, in, 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 real, in reality, you should have a weak inequality here, but uh, let's forget about it for a second. Uh, for the purposes of this presentation, I won't. Let's assume it's smaller, strictly smaller. Uh, and so now assume actually S minimizes this energy inside this class. So D is a fixed disk. Actually, here we are working with not disks, but rather K, K cubes. D, D, E, A cube. Uh, so, uh, so assume D is a, just a cube and uh, take all rectifiable compact sets uh, which uh, cannot be retracted onto the boundary of D, right? And assume S minimizes phi S. We can choose a minimizer because remember, I told you that we cooked up, we tailored DC so that the proof of existence of a minimizer actually works. Uh, it was the definition of DC is so that our proof of existence works. So we can actually take the minimizer of the of DF inside this class. We have to check that this class has desired properties, but it has. Okay. Uh, so since we have smaller energy, uh, actually, since this is a test pair, so uh, we know that this ratio is strictly greater than one. So the, the, the measure of S is actually strictly greater than one. We call this number theta. Uh, now, if we produce a sequence Ri by tiling D with scaled copies of S. So what I mean by tiling? Okay, so as I said, D, D is here. It's not a disk, actually, but a cube, a K cube. And what we do, so we have S somewhere, okay, so this is D, and we have S somewhere here, right? This S is above, say, a surface that is uh, kind of connected to the boundary of D. And then what we do is divide it into K to, 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 two to the K, uh, we, we take two to the K copies, two to the K copies of S, actually a rescale S. And we put it we put it somewhere here, right? We put a lot of copies here, and we do it uh, at infinitum, right? So we produce a sequence R I. So this would be this would be R say R one. Maybe this is R zero or this. R one is just like two to the two to the first, yeah, two to two to the k uh, copies of S and so on and so on, and we scale so that we scale it down. Uh, of course, with time. Uh, so we tile D with the prescaled copies of S. And and then we take varifold associated to this to this sequence. We pass to the limit. And, and you can easily prove that the limit has to be of this type. Why? Well, because this sequence Ri with this, this procedure is actually uh, making uh, it making it the homogenization, so the resulting varifold has to be translation invariant, so you don't, this measure does not depend on the space X, and uh, it's, since it's translation invariant, it has to actually be uh, some constant multiple of, of the Lebesgue measure on D, so uh, 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 that's, yeah, it's easy to, to, to see that this has to be exactly that. Uh, can you hear me? I mean, I'm, I think I. Yes, we hear yeah, you okay. perfectly as far as I can tell. Good, good, good. Okay, so uh, uh, so now we have to uh, make an observation. The observation is the following: uh, each of these scaled copies, I mean, each of these uh, elements of this sequence, 
is exactly the same energy as S. Well, it's an easy observation because the distribution of tangent planes is exactly the same as the one in S. So the energy is, I mean, yeah, it's very easy. So, uh, uh, okay, so now, uh, since it has the same energy, so if you pass to the limit, the energy is the same, so, and the S is a minimizer of CS, so it must be a critical point. A minimizer is a critical point, right? Okay, now, now since F is in AC, which is the same as BC, uh, we know that uh, mu is a Dirac. Good. Uh, and now we have a contradictory estimate. So first of all, we take the energy of the disk. It's simply less than if I multiply by theta, which is a constant bigger than one, and it's uh, it's bigger. This one, this one is bigger. Now, since mu is a Dirac on t, so so this energy of t is exactly well. If you look at the, what is v, mu is a Dirac on t, so you have this equality. Now, this equality is simply because the energy is uh, continuous with respect to varifold convergence. So you have this equality. And since uh, these guys are all the same, so this is a constant sequence. Swabek, could you please check that our screen is still up to date? So I see proof number five as the last thing, but I you you might be saying something related to a different slide. Uh, I don't see what's going on. Okay, let me just, oh. At this moment, you stopped sharing, it seems, uh, to restart it, I suppose. Can you hear me now? Uh, yeah, hearing is fine. Uh, what? So, okay. Now, uh, yeah, now I'm number back, six I'm has back. appeared and, and another line has line. appeared. Okay, so you, you're still in five. Uh, Okay, let me go back to that. That was the last one that was updated, at least on my screen. And then okay. I thought you were saying That's, more. Yeah, so, uh, okay, so, yeah, some technical difficulties. I don't know. Okay, so let's go further. So, first of all, we, ask, we, we do this observation that since Ri has the same distribution of tangent planes, you multiply that, you scale down, and this is the Ri has the same distribution of tangent planes as S, so they have the same energy. Uh, now, uh, since they have the same energy as, and S was a minimizer, then minimizer is, so Ri are also minimizer, so they are critical points, so also the limit is a critical point. Uh, now, uh, since uh, F was in, is in AC, which is the same as BC, so we know B has the desired Structure, so mu is a Dirac on T. Now uh, we can just see here that uh, this contradictory estimate, so uh, the, the energy of the disk is smaller than theta times the energy of theta is bigger than one. Right? And now uh, since V is exactly this and mu is a Dirac on T, so you have this equality. And then you have this equality simply because the energy phi F is continuous with respect to bifold convergence. And this is sequence is actually constant sequence, so you have this equality. But then you end up with uh, a contradiction. And this is basically the, the end of the proof, but I lied because I said that uh, they have the same energy, so they might be minimizer. And then we conclude that the uh, V is, uh, is stationary, but uh, why should this guy be a tester, right? But why, does, why should this guy be in this class? 
because it's, if it's not, then we cannot conclude. Uh, and this is another uh, a bit uh, complicated argument uh, involving some topological arguments. I will not present it now, but it's uh, a bit hard to show that actually we, we, we do this, uh, do this uh, multiplication in homogenization procedure, and each time you have to prove that you still cannot retract onto the boundary of the disk. It's not, uh, not, there is not obvious. Uh, so, uh, okay, but, but we kind of dealt with it and it's proven. Uh, okay, so this is concerning AC. Now let's look at AC more closely. Uh, first we have to, we, I introduced this calligraphic Z, which is the space of linear maps from Rn to Rn, and uh, AB, is a color product in this, this space, so it has a Euclidean structure. I want to think about that as some Euclidean space. Okay, so uh, now if you recall what AC was telling us, you were starting with probability measure on the Grassmannian. So assume we have a probability measure on the Grassmannian, and this uh, holds. So the kernel of a, AF mu uh, is, uh, is more than n minus k dimensional. So inside this kernel, if it has so many dimensions, we can find some n minus k dimensional space. Let's call it t-perp. And uh, now assume we can choose, basing on t, we can, for each t, assume we can choose qft, a linear map, such that uh, t, is the, in the, t is equal to the kernel, and the scalar product is non-negative for all s. And, and the equality holds only if S is positive. Assume we can do that. We don't, I'm not telling you how to do that, but assume we have something like that. Uh, and then I say that the atomic condition is satisfied for me. Why? Well, first of all, it's a simple linear algebra to see that the image of the adjoint of QF, T e is called exactly that, with that, that simple linear algebra. Now, since we know that, uh, uh, if I take AF nu, well, uh, if I take the scalar product of this and this, which is by definition here the trace of this composition, so the image of this guy is t perp, and t perp is in the kernel of AF nu, so this composition is zero, so the trace is also zero, right? Okay, uh, so we know this scalar product is zero, but on the other hand, we can uh, Allow the definition of AF nu, just integrating of these guys. And since scalar product is a linear operation, you can put it under the integral, and we have that. But we assume here that it's non negative and equality only if S equals T. So this equals zero means that S equals T for mu almost all S. Right? So, so this means that mu is basically an atomic measure, a Dirac on some T. So consequently, AF mu equals this, and the dimension of the kernel is exactly the same. So you see, if if for each basic, this means that if if we can find QFT for each t such that these two things hold, then the atomic condition holds. So we focus on the second one, on the scalar product uh, of T S star and QFT for all s, and equality only if s equals t, right? We want to have that. So, uh, what does it mean? What, what does this condition mean? It means, uh, okay, so let us define first this geometric object. Is a, this will be a, some kind of manifold. Uh, so it's just the image of the Grassmannian under this map. Okay, and it, it's a subset of that which is uh, from Rn, Rn. Right? First of all, linear map. And then, what does, how do we read this condition? Well, it says that G lies entirely on one side of the hybrid plane. Well, it's just exactly, I'm just putting it in other words. Uh, and we have exactly one contact point because equality only is as equal. So this is convexity. So I'm now defining what it means for each T, if for each T one can find QST, such that this guy holds. 
which I say that D is strictly convex. Okay, and as you see, okay, and in the paper, in the recent paper of Antonio de Rosa with Ricardo Pione, they introduce <coughs> uh, these conditions as I see, scalar atomic condition, and it, this is exactly the convexity of D, but they say one should use this, this formula. Okay, and they, sh and they show that this, if you lose this formula, you have uh, this, and you also have you also have uh, the first one, right? So this, this is the, equals the kernel. Okay, so uh, I use this formula, uh, but I computed it it's rather easy that you can also that is is exactly the same as identity minus. So if you look at uh, TFT was uh, like that was a projection onto T from some direction, then identity minus TFT is what? Uh, say it's a projection onto onto this space. Like that is a projection on identity minus T is in the kernel. Uh, so you could you could uh, name you could call this uh, this guy here uh projection onto the f normal space i would call that an f normal space and they introduce this condition sac as i see uh, and they say it implies ac and has some more properties okay uh, and it means basically it means that g is strictly convex this this calligraphic d here okay so uh, but still you you would see that you would think that this condition, uh, concerning the questions that I raised like a few slides ago, uh, this condition should be easily easy check, checkable, right? Because it's like now it's uh, you have some algebraic conditions here, but uh, it's not actually so easy to check because there are two points involved in checking it, and maybe it's not impossible. But uh, in the paper, I, I think they didn't didn't find uh, specific examples yet. Uh, they didn't check the condition for some any uh, specific example. Okay, there is also an, a uniform version of of the SAC, namely if you have this, which corresponds to uniform convexity of G, because it really means that if you have your manifold, say this is your calligraphic G, you have a point called T, and you take a tangent plane here to this manifold, it means that uh, calligraphic G. And it means basically that if you go a bit, if you go here to S, then this, uh, well, what? It means basically that uh, this guy is a square, is roughly, if you have R, R squared, right? R and R. It gives you a bound from below. So it's, it's a really, really uniform convexity of, of this manifold. And this uniform version of the SAT allowed them to prove regularity, but for Lipschitz graph. So if you assume a priori V is a Lipschitz graph, a stationary Lipschitz graph, and then you can prove V is regular, as, as regular as F allows it. Now, they also have, uh, I mean, it's a tool for the, for the proof of the first dot. The second dot is a tool for the proof of the first one, but uh, maybe it's Important that they also obtain this catch poly inequality, which uh, gives you, I mean, for for stationary variables, right? uh, that the tilt is controlled by the height. Tilt is controlled by the height. Okay. Uh, and uh, they also prove that this uniform version of the SAC is stable under C2 perturbation. Maybe important now. If you have one integrand, then you can take a whole neighborhood of it. It also has the same within the class. So they, they introduced this. Uh, so now we have SAC. And I have a, well, I have a master student, Mario Janos, and we are working on the following conjecture. I mean, well, almost could be, I'm almost sure it's true. Uh, so if you define for each t this map, which is just the, the scalar product, so you should think that g in 
E and you just take uh, what you have uh, E, uh, right? You have some U F here, yeah? and uh, so you look at uh, you look at this manifold uh, calligraphy G over the plane T, and you you, you just take the this the height and the height, but it's not. Well, right, some kind of a height over this tangent plane. Uh, so look at this map, and uh, then, well, this was already proven uh, that f t of t is zero. Well, so the picture that I drew here is actually the correct one. And uh, moreover, if you take any <laughs> tangent plane to the Grassmannian, so the derivative in this direction is zero. So this again means that it's actually the, the picture looks like this. So you have the, the calligraphic G is really tangent to this plane T, which is orthogonal to Q. Uh, right, it's written here. And uh, so our conjecture, well, condition two, is that this is non-negative, is plausible if if we can check that the uh, second derivative is non-negative definite. So I want I want Marius to check uh, this condition and uh, whether well I hope this condition can be easily checked for something that is given by an explicit formula like uh, the capital F the integral. So uh, this is my ongoing work. Uh, it's a kind of a conjecture, and we also since two months ago I gave the similar talk two months ago in Cortona, and since then I worked. Uh, a lot with Antonio on his conditions, and we already have a con conjecture. So uh, we also have a conjecture with Antonio about the equivalence of all these conditions. So uh, recall that we defined weak convexity was something that you will check convexity inside our k plus one dimensional subspaces. So we have a conjecture with Antonio that actually uh, weak convexity implies a uh, color atomic condition, which implies AC, which is the same as BC. This, was, this is proven. This is proven. Uh, so this part is already proven. Uh, but uh, now this should be this should be easy. And uh, the thing that we want to prove is this one. Uh, and we have a I think we have a clear idea on how to do it, but I don't want to talk about more about this announced the conjecture. Mm. Uh, okay, and I think this is all. Thank you for listening. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the talk. Uh... Uh -huh, maybe I should say that actually this one is checkable. Uh, uh, for example, uh, this uh, Hausdorff integral, how, uh, Hausdorff integrand is weakly convex. So uh, this one is checkable, and also there are other examples. So other examples are known uh, for for weak convex. So uh, this would actually give an example. Oh, are there any questions? Please uh, just feel free to unmute yourself, or I'll try to see if anyone raises the hand. <clears throat> well, I, I'm late. Sorry, uh, I'm late for your talk. Uh, I have a stupid question. <laughs> May I? Yeah. Yes. Ah, so, so this in your last slide, that means all these convexity, the notion are, they are all equivalent, right? In the conjecture. Yeah, it's a conjecture, but yeah, I believe so. Yeah, I believe so. 
We don't didn't write the proof yet, but uh, we have idea how to do, how to do the proof. We have to do the all the computation, but I'm kind of positive about it. Yes, yes, and all the all these are could be the same. Yeah, uh, in, a, in consequence, that would mean all of them are equivalent. So, so uh, yeah, so I shouldn't ask questions because I didn't follow from the beginning. So all the, this kind of weak convexity, I mean, is it the same or different from um, um, Moray's uh, convexity for elliptic system? Which, which convexity for elliptic systems? Like the one that, by, I, mean, uh, I mean, maybe let's call uh, quasi-convex. Uh, quasi -convex. Uh, yeah, quasi-convex. Uh, so there is a relation with quasi-convexity. Actually, in this paper of Ricardo Antonio, we have a one. Uh, they have a small lemma, I don't know, theorem that they show. Uh, uh, what they show, I think, uh, SAC. I mean, you, you can like you can consider this energies on graphs, right? And then you have mm -hmm. a parameterized surface with a graph of a function. So this function satisfies some some, some PDE. And then uh, this is, right. Uh, I don't remember right now. I think that SAC, if, if you have SAC for your F and you translate it to graphs, then you have quasi-convexity. I think the way they do it. Uh, but I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not, it is not clear for me at least uh, whether you have any equivalent, like uh, it's, is any of these conditions equivalent to quasi-convexity? I don't know. Uh, okay. Yeah, I think I, I should, I probably should look at, uh, is it a preprint? Uh, well, maybe I could ask. This one, is, I think it's still a preprint. I didn't check today. <laughs> uh, I, I think Antonio didn't tell me that it's accepted. Oh, I think not yet accepted anywhere. Mm -hmm. It's still a preprint, yeah. yeah. But concerning quasi convexity, I think it's uh, just a small, uh, small lemma that just shows that it has some, there is some connection between uh, scalar atomic condition and quasi convexity. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think, okay, no, they actually use it maybe in the regular because they use, I mean, yeah. Yeah, I think they use quasi-complexity actually to, to to prove regularity because they have to use some elliptic theory to, to prove regularity in the graph. I think they need it not just no, just not just to show there is a relation, but they actually need it to prove regularity. Yeah. Okay. So maybe I sent you an email if I couldn't find the uh, program. It's an interesting topic, anyway. So. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe I could add a related question. Uh, can you go back one one slide? Uh, so just to make sure I get the oops, uh, it's smaller, becomes larger again. Uh, so the first inclusion, that's what the, the key part uh, you say for the conjecture. Uh, then the yeah. next inclusion, that's the, that is the paper you mentioned. It is already proven or not? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, I, this one is proven. And actually this proof is very simple. I actually gave you the proof. Uh, uh, right. Okay, so just, yeah, yeah. I feel like you talked about it, but uh, just wanna make sure. Uh, but, but now I'm wondering about the last inclusion. So because then it's really about the first and the last inclusion, the conjecture, right? The last one. So what, one. what about the last inclusion? You, you, is it is it a simple thing or a, you? you uh, yeah, or I think so. Something? It's a, a weak convert. I mean, uh, because what? Because weak convexity is also known to be equivalent to saying that, okay, convexity in codimension one, right? 
so if m equals k plus one, so then uh, uh, convexity of f. I think this is a well known thing that is proven. I mean, uh, I know at least one paper where, where it is stated. I don't. I'm not sure whether it's proven there. I think it's given as an as an exercise. Uh huh. Yeah, I think. So, but if you have a polyhedron, or uh, have a, or a, I'm not so sure whether synthesis are, are uh, enough. So for any, okay, I think sim for any simplex. They don't have the sum of uh, energy of the uh, of uh, size of all sides but one. Uh -huh. So one. Bigger than the energy. Which is left, right? Uh, so uh, I think this is uh, some kind of a simple exercise. At, at least, uh, okay, I have to confess, <laughs> I didn't do it. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, it's stated in one in one paper that I know uh, that basically convexity in co-dimensional convexity means that you yeah you have a you have this property which is which is a uh, which of course the uh, amgen elasticity would imply because uh, well amgen elasticity is I mean this synthesis if you treat a simplex right like have a simplex here, okay, and so this is your base, and the sum of energies of the side is bigger than the sum of the base. Uh, well, the simple, clearly the sum of the side is a surface that cannot be retracted onto the boundary of the base, right? So, uh, so I'm going electricity says exactly, exactly that uh, for each, I mean, in particular, angular electricity gives that for every syntax, this is this is true. And uh, and I think convexity in codimension one exactly is exactly equivalent to saying exactly that. Uh, right. So uh, so weak convexity would mean. Well, in, in higher dimension, weak convexity actually would mean that uh, if, I, if I erase that, so weak convexity for any uh, or any what a plus one dimensional simplex uh, Rn now, right? It's the same, but the slice in a plus one dimensional space uh, that would be that should be the same. So. Uh, so I think this this uh, inclusion should be easy. Uh, okay, it's not. Uh, uh, it's still a conjecture, I, uh, but I think this should not be a problem. Yeah, I, I would be very much appreciated to get away from the algebraic topology condition to check on. It would just be much nicer if you could compute differentials. Uh, right. Are there any other questions? Check. Uh, not missing any hands. Well, I don't see any. 
So in, in this case, I would like to thank our speakers, Romir Kraszynski, again. And I'll end the recording now.